months. Then I have to, then I have to log in and uh, uh, log into uh, this using the GNN user name and um, and then I forget how to do a lot of this stuff on Zoom. Um, well, uh, good good afternoon and uh, good morning for some of you folks. And uh, my name is Wen Ming. I am a product manager at AWS AI. Uh, and again, this is a the GNN uh, user uh, group meeting. Uh, we do this every month on the last week um, of uh, last uh, week Thursday of each month. Uh, and uh, this is on Pacific time. And we uh, uh, basically bring a couple of researchers or industry users to come in and talk about how they use GNNs. Uh, so the meeting is sponsored by, uh, joint, jointly sponsored by NVIDIA uh, uh, crew graph team um, and also the DGL team at uh, uh, AWS. Um, so, so today we have two topics. Uh, we originally had three, and unfortunately, our third uh, presenter uh, had to uh, run off to the hospital due to an emergency. Um, so, we'll probably invite her back to talk about uh, 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 billion billion uh, edge uh, graphs that uh, she's deploying at her company called Mate Twine in in China. So, it's a very interesting talk. Unfortunately, she's not here. Um, so, but our first two presenters are, um, so Maddie uh, Salam, um, and he will be presenting uh, a Graphite, a graph-induced feature extraction for point cloud registration. It's a very, very interesting uh, uh, topic there. Um, and our second presenter will uh, go into uh, GTNs or uh, graph transformers. Um, and uh, uh, Maddie, I'll let you uh, uh, share your screen and you can introduce yourself uh, um, and what you're uh, doing at the uh, university. Thanks. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so let me quickly share my screen. Um, can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mahdi Saleh, um, a PhD student at um, Technical University of Munich. And today I'm going to talk about uh, graphite, graph-induced uh, feature extraction for point cloud registration. It's um, our um, recent uh, publication from last year, basically. And it's a pleasure to present this uh, for you guys. Um, so first, uh, very quickly about um, our research group at uh, Technical University of Munich. It's um, Tom. Um, capture or computer aided medical procedures. Um, as the name suggests, we do a lot of medical image processing and AI medicine. And we do um, have um, um, some researchers working with graph neural networks um, and um, some, um, um, there is a spectrum of works, uh, some of them on uh, medical, um, which, for example, do disease prediction. This is one of them. These are some of the recent works, for example, Inception GCN, or this is another one that combines um, CNN features and regularizes them with uh, GNNs uh, for also disease prediction using also CT scans. And another more recent one is um, differentiable graph modules also. Um, it enables um, some automation for uh, downstream tasks. And um, this is um, some of the works um, that um, exist in nurture. And um, also we have a big computer vision, a general computer vision group. Um, as you might know, there is this topic of uh, seeing graphs. There is um, um, where you can basically in a 3D scene, you can uh, construct uh, graphs given the um, relationships, you can construct them, you can embed these features in the graph, and you can also use this um, hierarchical representation in, the, in, the, um, in any basically computer vision task. Uh, for example, here there is like a 2D case, um, you can actually manipulate these scene graphs um, and the relationship basically between the objects existing in the image, and you can synthesize the manipulated uh, image um, uh, from this graph. 
or um, there's also a wide uh, line of uh, um, a line of works and different tasks and computer visions, for example, detection or semantic segmentation. This is a upcoming CVPR work, which uh, basically um, uses scene graphs also to incrementally do uh, semantic and instance segmentation, um, also in uh, in um, RGBD scans. But uh, today I will talk on a different problem, which is um, registration. First of all, what is this uh, registration task? Um, assume we have a point cloud uh, source frame P and another point cloud or a 3D scan uh, Q. Uh, basically what registration means, it means that we want to align these two frames or these two scans uh, in order to bring this, we need to apply a rigid transformation uh, to source frame P, uh, which will apply a rotation and a translation to bring the frame P to Q. So at the end of this registration, um, not only we visually align these, but also we want to uh, basically regress or find out this uh, rotation and translation. This is a very traditional computer vision task and is much used in the classical or also recently deep learning um, uh, uh, methods. And it has a wide range of applications. As you might imagine, uh, registration is used in scene reconstruction, also on uh, object reconstruction when you have multiple view of an object or a scene. You can use it for tracking. You can track an object basically by registering rigid objects. One can also use um, registration to do 60 pose estimation. For example, a case that you have a CAD model existing of an object and you have a scan or you have a, like a depth sensor and you can basically register these uh, point clouds to a CAD model. So this will give you the 60 pose estimation. Similarly, you can use registration for tasks such as odometry or SLAM, which um, you can basically register point clouds or frames or depth uh, scans to do um, simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, also, you can do flow estimation, very similarly to registration. For every point, you can also um, basically find out how much it's um, moved in space in order to uh, register to the other frame. And uh, you might imagine this can also have applications also in medical, both on rigid data sets, rigid cases, also on non-rigid scenarios. So what is a typical uh, registration framework or what is a pipeline to do registration? There is this uh, local methods and global methods with global methods, it means that we have two frames and we want to basically uh, find out its uh, rotation and translation from frame A to B. Where uh, here, for example, this is a very famous method, uh, iterative closest point, where in order to um, find out the rotation translation, uh, you basically form this uh, close from solution and the energy and you try to minimize this energy so that the translated P and the Q has the least distance. And this you can solve iteratively and that's what it's an ICP method do. This is um, still commonly used, but it's the problem is uh, that ICP is very uh, dependent on initialization, which means that if you have a bad initialization you might be trapped in a local minima. As you see on the left, the, um, initial, um, the, the, the first local minima that the ICP finds uh, might be trapped and the method might be stuck. So this is not a very reliable um, method to do, for example, partial scan registration, which is in many cases uh, what, what you want to do in real life. On the other side, there are local methods. Um, local methods, uh, you can assume very similarly to uh, 2D cases. Uh, you might know the descriptors um, such as SIFT, SURF, or many other 
handcrafted descriptors where you basically try to represent a local region in the image um, using histograms or many different techniques, mathematical methods. Um, and these descriptors or a vector can be used to match two images. It can be used in a, a stitching or detection or a retrieval. And uh, um, recently also they're boosted with deep learning techniques. Similar to this in 3D, you can also represent a local surface or region um, using histograms or mathematical methods, which is also um, like aligned with 2D case. And with this, you can also register point clouds. This is more robust to partial scans, basically because you match these descriptors uh, as many as many uh, correspondence that you find in the in the local neighborhood. So getting back to point cloud, um, point cloud data is very challenging to process. Um, it is a sparse and it's unordered, as you can see in the LiDAR scan, it's very sparse. And conven conventional CNNs do not apply very well. Um, let me show you an example. So assume we have these four points in a point set. Um, you can basically, um, each of these points has a coordinate, you can assume, and um, you can basically order them and number them one, two, three, four. If you basically reorder these points, you will still have the very same point cloud. So this means that the point points are a permutation invariant. As you uh, reorder them, you would get the essential the same point cloud. So that's a bit tricky to play with uh, convolutional neural networks because convolutional neural networks apply to Euclidean data and to ordered data where in point clouds, the data is stored in like a set and this is order invariant. So we need to find some methods that is order invariant. But still, you can try uh, applying convolutional uh, uh, concepts to point clouds where you can basically use a different representation like voxels. With the voxels, you basically try and you, you, you can build the occupancy grid in the 3D data and then use similar concepts such as convolutions and apply them to three-dimensional data. Uh, yeah, as you might imagine, this is not very um, efficient as um, you have 3D convolutions and it's very expensive to process and find such features to do registration. So um, either you need to go very fine and then you will have very expensive calculations or you need to go very coarse and then you will lose a lot of uh, local fine details. So instead, one might want to uh, use uh, directly work with point clouds. And this is what PointNet suggests as a pioneering work that works directly on point clouds. Uh, it applies some symmetrical functions and here like MLPs and on every point it applies uh, MLP and uh, basically at the end it uses some uh, global uh, pooling layer to do tasks such as classification or segmentation. Um, although this is very successful, there are some drawbacks here. So every point, every feature that is processed here has an individual path. So basically, uh, every point is applied to the very same uh, MLP. This is not very ideal. So there is no mutual feature. There is no neighborhood that can play. So as um, you process point clouds with point net, you will lose a lot of geometrical features or local embedding. So instead one can use graph neural networks, which here is the point that graphs are getting a lot of attention in the community of point cloud processing because you can actually process neighborhood information and not only process every point individually. So with graphs, um, you can basically um, incorporate gra ge more geometrical features and also process the um, 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 uh, features more aware of the neighborhood. And this is more ideal 
to design our descriptor. That's why instead of using point representation or voxel representation, we propose to use graphs in order to process point clouds, in order to describe local, and local features to do point cloud registration. Also, uh, contrary to the previous works that they do sparse description, basically uh, to do uh, matching, correspondence matching and registration, we propose to have very dense description and dense key point extraction so that we can do a better and finer registration. So how it works, uh, the pipeline starts with a point cloud we basically break the point cloud into many patches. And every patch, we take the point cloud, we bring it into the local reference frame and we convert it to a graph. So this is how um, like uh, the graph representation work. Every node here is uh, basically the points in the point cloud which uh, represented by the coordinates in the local reference frame and the normal vectors. And the edges are associated when um, two nodes or two points in space have um, distance below a certain threshold or below a, a radius or a ball query. Um, if two points are above this threshold, they're not connected. And if they're below this threshold, they're connected. And there is also a value associated to these uh, edges given this uh, distance, Euclidean distance. Then how the architecture works. Um, we want to describe this um, uh, local patch uh, with a descriptor vector and also find the key point best representing this, 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 this patch. So we start by feeding this, this, this patch into a G, GNN and uh, we increase our hops basically in the graphs in order to, the, to let the features traverse in the graph uh, at different scales. Um, and the intuition behind is that we want to extract features on a multi-scale level. So we let the features pass in different hops. And then we apply a symmetric function like a max and a fully connected to learn a descriptor, a very dense descriptor. Following that, we do the inverse and we go back to the um, patch size and we'll basically extract or regress a value per point. And this regressed value represents how salient this point in the graph is. And with this, we basically um, can extract the key point with the most salient point can be extracted as a representative key point. We also regress a confidence or a score value, which can help us for registration. Basically, it shows how complex or geometrically complex this um, patch is. So at the end, we have a key point, we have a descriptor and a confidence value for every patch. How we train this? We train this with metric learning or triplet. Um, First, we initialize with some um, synthetically generated primitive data sets where we know for every, um, every primitive, we know the corner. So this is a very, um, in a supervised way, we know basically where is the corner in this graph. And we built triplets basically the anchor and the positive are the same patch from a different sampling or different view. And the negative is a different shape, basically, or different corner. And in other data sets, we can actually use any point cloud data, like model net, which includes um, a lot of objects synthetically, to also uh, break it down into patches and let it train. But in here, we do not have uh, such um, 
such annotations, such as key, where, where is the key point. So here we do our network initialization or warm up uh, initially with uh, learning the supervised um, value in order to express the key point, um, a score in order to express the confidence, and a descriptor, basically using, using a triplet loss. And then afterwards, we warm up and initialize the network. We put it into any data sets, such as model net, where we do not have so, such supervision. And we basically learn everything unsupervised or uh, using metric learning. At the end, uh, how we register point clouds, um, given the purse, as you see it in red and blue, in the model net, for example, we uh, describe every patch. And we, here you can see the patches or the key points that are um, the most confident key points that are matched. And with this, we can basically use an SVD based pulse estimation to uh, find out uh, uh, find out the registration or rotation and translation. And finally, we can apply an ICP to refine this. Here, as the ICP is already um, well initialized, we are we can be sure that it would not be stuck in some local minimum. These are the results on model net registration. We outperform. Um, the previous works that are mostly global methods. And also we, um, we still get good uh, description under uh, noise. There is another famous benchmark in computer vision for uh, registration, namely 3D match, which consists of 3D scans and some seed points to describe and match this is uh, the initial seed points. This is how our graphite descriptor sees the data. Um, here we basically bring down or reduce the um, descriptor using PCA in order to visualize the data. Uh, the data set, as you see, it shows kind of um, the most salient points. Here is uh, what is the confidence or the score value per region. As you see, the black regions are flat regions. so. The descriptor is not confident to match them, but as you have more complex shapes, you uh, the descriptor um, gets more uh, the the confidence gets higher. And these are the validated key points that we use for uh, registration. So at the end, how the uh, works on three uh, D match? These are the key points that are validated or masked for every scene. We basically find their matches or the corresponding key point on the other scene um, using Euclidean distance in the descriptor space. And we can register them uh, as, as discussed. These are the results on um, 3D match. Note that we did not train our descriptor on any real data set, but still we have performed at existing works on, on the 3D match. Um, data set. So as a conclusion, um, what we do, we describe patches using our um, descriptor, which is very lightweight, and it's also based on graphs. Um, our model is trained with minimum supervision. Apart from the initial initialization, uh, we basically do metric learning, and uh, we do not have any supervision for key point or descriptor. Um, our descriptor not only, our, our model not only describes the patch, but also extracts some key points or the salient points. These key points can be used also to subsample a huge point cloud. And it also can this um, can downsample the point cloud to a well distributed set for registration. Uh, we can use a combination of key point and descriptor. Although we have not trained on synthetic point clouds, we, we can generalize well to real scans. And finally, what is next or as a future um, works or current focus, uh, we uh, want to bring graphite to 
uh, graphs for meshes. As you know, meshes are already the sort of data that have graphs connecting basically vertices and building faces or edges. These um, we can assume as graphs and we can actually use them um, to describe um, the local surfaces. A uh, graphite can also be applied to deformable surfaces. Here we, we, all, we all assumed a um, rigid case, a rigid scenario, but uh, one can also apply this, um, the same concepts to deformable surfaces. Um, another idea is to integrate high level graphs to build some hierarchical uh, understanding of the shape or a scene. Um, this can be another idea and also um, it, um, Overall, on the application side, the graphite can be applied to different um, applications such as flow, tracking, retrieval, a lot of uh, common uh, 3D point cloud based um, uh, applications in robotics, augmented reality, or uh, autonomous driving. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You can also reach me uh, on, on my email. But yeah, if you have any questions right away, I'm happy to answer. Any questions? You uh, feel, please feel free to type that in the chat window, or you can also just unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Hello, Madi. So this is Joe. Um, uh, one question about your patch selection: How do you choose the patch size? Yeah, so the batch size in terms of number of nodes in the graph, you yes, mean? Yes, and, and some kind of aspect ratio, right? They're, they're not always uniformly, you know, spherical or whatever. Yeah, it's very dependent on the data set. So in, in, in our experiments, we have two variation of uh, graphite, uh, um, a small size and a, a, like a more like a low fidelity graphite and also a more denser one um, uh, for real scans because the receptive field or the how, how much um, points are needed to describe a local neighborhood, it needs to be bigger. So in that case, we have like, for example, 225 uh, points into that we want to describe. In, in cases that are synthetic, we have less points and we use like 81 points basically to uh, represent the patch, but how we construct them also, uh, we start um, any ways you can, you can just, you can construct them as you wish. You can do randomly select the patch. You can, you can break it down. It, they, the patches can uh, overlap or they can be separate. It depends also on the data set, um, given different benchmarks, they have different uh, also settings. So in particular, there's no need for a, a close to planar for the graphs, they don't need to be close to two dimensional, anything like that? No, it doesn't need, actually it's preferred if they're not planar so that uh, you can actually extract some. So if it's completely planar, the, the model ideally would uh, produce um, low confidence because it's not a good idea to register flat surfaces. For example, if you have a case of walls and uh, like uh, floors, you do not want to actually register them because they are very similar to each other geometrically. So the model with this confidence idea can basically mm, uh, also express how much um, flat it is or how much geometrically complex it is. And this can be used also to register or to basically uh, invalidate a lot of uh, patches or a lot of descriptors. That's oh, really, thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for the interesting talk. Um, so uh, based on what I understood from the talk uh, is that uh, for making the graphs, you consider like a specific threshold uh, as radius, and then um, you kind of connect um, a specific node to all the nodes, um, other nodes within that range. Um, and like at some point you mentioned uh, like two hops and three hops uh, graphs. And I was thinking that, for example, a two hop graph would be the same as the one hop when the radius is two times the previous radius. Uh, is that correct? Uh, 
Um, so actually, it's it's the first part of your question. And first, thanks for the question. Um, it, it's not actually true that we connect all node to all the nearby nodes. We only, so first there is a patch uh, concept and there is like, the edge concept that we, you can see also on this slide. The edge concept, the radius here is not actually about the patch size. It's about like um, uh, how much close the points can be together. So this is much different than the patch size. So at the end, a graph in a patch might be in a, in a kind of similar as you see in the slide. So some nodes might be uh, connected to many nodes some might be actually alone some some might some nodes might be even not connected if it's a super sparse point cloud some uh, patches might have some points that they're not connected to and this is also a good representation so the descriptor can know okay what is the density of this um, this basically region mm -hmm. okay was uh, it clear uh, yeah thanks um so, and for, for the other part of my question, um, like um, the, the, where you uh, talked about like um, uh, K hops uh, graphs. Um, so um, like, is that the same as increasing the radius for making the graph? Because um, when we are discussing about, for example, two hops graphs, two nodes are connected. If uh, for, um, the first one is within radius r of the second one and the second one is within radius r of the third one. So when we discuss two hops graphs, um, is it the same as uh, considering a graph in the first place that is built with a radius of two r, two times the radius that the initial graph was made of? Um, to some extent, yes, um, uh, because it's just the threshold, the radius. So any 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 two any pair of nodes that are below that threshold are connected below that radius so you can assume that the maximum traverse of a feature in a two hop would be um, two times of the radius but that's the maximum that's the highest value it might be less um, given um, given that we connect the nodes that are below that radius so it can be Yes, but yeah, the maximum uh, feature traversal uh, in two hops would be uh, two times the radius. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so th that's what I was wondering that, for example, like um, if you had experimented that with various radius, uh, would it have like maybe similar results to considering uh, multi-hop graphs? We indeed tried different hops and tried also different um, radiuses, but we actually didn't study the correlation of these two. Um, it might be interesting to investigate if there is an effect. It might be actually, it might be the case um, if, if we change this radius, but you cannot also do it because it's also dependent on the size of the um, graphs and number of nodes and the number of edges. Yeah. In uh, our case, thanks. it was like a tree at, at max. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your talk and your answer. Any other questions? No? Great. So we have our next presenter. Thanks. So yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. So Maddie, if you can uh, uh, share your file with everybody, that would be great. So just the uh, uh, PowerPoint, that would be great. So uh, while you're doing that, um, we'll have uh, Locke uh, start uh, sharing the screen. So next up, we have Locke Kong. He's going to be presenting optimizing graph transformer networks with graph-based techniques. He's from University of Texas in Austin. Hello, everyone. Is my screen visible? Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Cool. OK. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Lau. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm a PhD student there. And today, I'm going to be presenting some work on graph transformer networks, specifically optimizing these graph transformer networks by formulating it as a graph problem. 
This is joint work with Abby and the Katanagraph company. So let's get started. To begin with, I'm sure since this is a GNN user group, everyone knows what a GNN is, but here I just briefly recap it. Essentially what a GNN is, is it's deep neural networks on graphs. You take the data on a vertex or an edge, and in order to account for the fact that it's a graph, instead of just treating each data point individually, what you do is you're going to account for the topology of the graph by considering the neighbors of each vertex. So for example, in this example below, instead of passing in the vertex feature for some vertex, I'm going to do aggregation first before I pass it into DNN layer where I'll then get new features. So that is the graph neural network in a nutshell. Now, the one limitation of these graph neural networks is that they're typically what I call blind to heterogeneity. And what I mean by this is that assuming that your graph is heterogeneous, meaning it has types on the nodes and the edges, most GNN architectures will not by default account for these edge types unless they are baked in directly into the features on the nodes and edges. So for example, on the graph on the right here, I have a graph with many different node types and there are many different edge types. It's called, it's the Kembo data set. And the reason that being blind to heterogeneity is bad for graph neural networks is that if you were leveraging the fact that you had these types on the nodes and edges, you could improve the training and possibly get better results in your training and inferencing. So to get around this, let me define the notion of a meta path. A meta path is simply a path where each of the edges in the path might ha have a type, heterogeneous edges. In this example here, I've created a meta path has comp record based on this edge type and has source based on another edge type here. And what I can do given a meta path is I can take the meta path and I can draw an edge between the two endpoints of the metapath. And what this does is it's going to represent heterogeneity with a single untyped edge. And the other advantage is that by linking the, these endpoints directly, I have a direct link between the endpoints rather than a bunch of hops between the endpoints. And more importantly, for this edge that I draw, I can weight it based on my perceived importance of that metapath. So this is the core idea behind something called a graph transformer. Once you have a, met a set of metapaths, what you do is you'll find all such metapaths in your graph. You score them using some function. And by using that score and the endpoints of a metapath, I'll draw every single metapath edge between the paths and I'll get what I call a metapath graph. At this point, once I have the metapath graph, Instead of using the original graph that was passed in to my graph network, I will instead pass in my metapath graph. The difference here now is that each of these edges in the metapath graph represents a heterogeneous relationship. So now the GCN, graph sage, GIN, whatever is your favorite GNN architecture, is now aware of the fact that this edge is representing a type relationship. And furthermore, because these weight, these edges are going to be weighted, the importance of the metapath will also come across in the weighted aggregation you'll do in the GNN step. So as in a regular G GNN, you'll end up with some classifications at the end. Those classifications might be wrong or they might be right. And depending on the status of wrong or right, you can use that error and backpropagate it to correct the weights in the GCN when you again repeat this process until you get good accuracy. Now the key in the GTN is that you have this scoring function on the left here. The scoring function might not be rating the metapaths correctly based on the importance. However, because it's a part of this entire training pipeline, what you can do is you can take the error from the no classification step and you can back propagate it all the way back to the scoring function where you can then use the gradient to guide the scoring of each of the metapaths towards a more correct setting. And this was shown in past work to both be able to find metapaths that experts typically tell you about 
So you don't actually have to have an expert tell you what the important metapaths are. You can find them by using a GTN. And in addition, it sh it's been shown that it can improve the accuracy of learning if you're using it for a heterogeneous graph. Now, the problem that I'm going to talk about today is about the existing GTN implementation from that original GTN paper. The original GTN paper did the implementation in PyTorch. And the way that it generated these metapaths was that it created a dense matrix for each of the edges in the metapath. And it did dense matrix multiplication. Now, the problem with this is that it's a dense matrix. It's of size O of n squared, where n is the number of vertices in your graph. What this means is that if you have multiple of these dense matrices, you'll end up using a lot of memory on your machine. Therefore, you can't actually run on large graphs. What this ultimately means is that the original implementation has limited utility in practice because they can't run on even average size graphs of 100K or 200K nodes. So today, what I'll talk about is scalable graph transformer networks. What our contributions are the following. First, I'm going to tell you about a very simple way to formulate the graph transformer network metapath graph creation as a series of graph operations. Second, I'll add on to this formulation by talking about a random walk approach that will sample the important metapaths. And by sampling the metapaths, I don't have to enumerate every single metapath in a graph. Therefore, I reduce both the memory and the compute cost. And finally, I'm going to talk about the evaluation we did of this uh, GTN implementation in the Katana Graph Engine. And we show that we perform the original implementation by 6.5 times on average with the non-sampling implementation. However, if you use the random walk approach that I'll talk about later, on top of this, we can get up to 150 times faster with no accuracy compromise. And because this implementation of the GTN is more space efficient, we can run on larger graphs that were previously possible than previously possible. So here's the outline of the rest of my talk. It's pretty simple. The first thing I'll talk about is the graph formulation for graph transformer networks. And then I'll briefly touch upon the sampling that we do and why it's required. And then I'll move on to the experimental results that I discussed earlier. So before I talk about how to actually find metapaths, I mentioned earlier at the beginning that you typically have something of a scoring function for a metapath in order to determine its importance. I'll define it more formally now. So say I have a scoring function f, it's going to take an edge type and it's going to take the position of the edge in the metapath. And it's going to assign to me the importance of that particular edge type at that particular path position in the path. Now that's just a scoring for a single edge. If I wanted to score a metapath, I'll just simply apply this function to each edge type in the metapath. And that's shown here below. And therefore the scoring, the score of the metapath is simply the product of each of the individual component edge scores. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the function is going to be learned during the training step by using the error that we back propagate from the graph convolutional network. So now that you know the specifics of the scoring function, let's go into how it was done in the original implementation. As I mentioned, it's using a bunch of dense matrix multiplies. And as again, as I mentioned, for each edge in the position, in this case, the metapath length is two, two edges. I'm going to create a copy of the graph as an adjacency matrix. This is my original graph here, and this is the adjacency matrix. So for example, if you have a row, a column, row A, column B, it means that there's an edge with weight two in that set. And you note that based on your scoring function, the score for position one and position two are different. As you can see here, A and B might have a particular score two in position one, but it might have a score three in position three. So what this implementation does is it's going to create a dense matrix for each position in the path. And by multiplying these dense matrices, what you'll end up with is all length two metapaths of the original graph. This is, as you might be able to tell, space inefficient because you have to create a dense matrix for every single position in your metapath. Now, abstractly, what we want to do is we simply just want to find all metapaths above the sum length 
we score them, and we draw the edge between the endpoints. So instead of using dense matrix multiplications, we can formulate it quite simply in graph terms. All we have to do is we run any pathfinding algorithm. That's up to the implementer's choice. You run a pathfinding algorithm. You'll get some path of length L. You take your scoring function, apply it to the path. You get the score, and you add it to the edge weight for that score. So below is an example here. I have, again, this edge scoring matrix, which tells you the score for a type and a position. And I have the original graph. I'll simply find the every single length two meta path. In this case, there's three of them, A, B, C, A, D, C, and A, D, E. I score each one. And then for the endpoints, I'll just simply add it to the meta path graph. Now let's talk about a bit about the trade-offs that this formulation makes. One problem is that during the backward step where I'm back propagating the, uh, the gradients from the GCN step, I will also need to know the every single meta path that was found in the forward phase. Because storing the paths is expensive and it causes space overhead, instead of storing every single meta path that we find, we have to do some recomputation of each of the meta paths that we found in the forward phase. This is expensive. Secondly, the, depending on the pathfinding algorithm that you use, the enumeration of your paths might be very redundant. And as an example here, I have two paths, A, B, C, D, E, and A, F, C, D, E. You notice here that C, D, E is found twice. This is redundant, and this is a very common problem in pathfinding. So instead of doing, to avoid a bit of redundancy, in our formulation, what we can do is we can actually find length L over two subpaths. So instead of finding A, B, C, D, E, we find A, B, and we find C, D, E. Once we find these two subpaths, we can score them both separately based on the offsets of the position in the scoring function. And to get the length, the score of the length L subpath, all you have to do is multiply the score of the first subpath and the second subpath. This will cut the work that you have to do in pathfinding by half because you're only finding like L over two. However, there's a space trade-off because you now have to store the scores for each of these subpaths rather than just scoring, storing the scores for one length L path. Because of the space trade-off, although we could technically break it down to say L over four, L over eight, and so on, we don't do that because the space trade-off would be pretty high. So we stick to L over two. So the problem still with both approaches, both the matrix approach and the graph approach, is that as the graph size and the meta path size grows, the number of paths grows as well. And scaling to larger graphs has difficulties in both settings. In the matrix formulation, as I mentioned, each of these dense matrices is size n squared, where n is the number of vertices. This will grow prohibitively large as your n approaches even average size, such as 100k, 200k, et cetera. In a graph formulation, although it doesn't have this issue with dense matrices, recall that you have to now enumerate every single path in both the forward phase and the backward phase if you don't want to use memory to store the intermediate paths. And storing the intermediate paths in itself would also be prohibitively large as the problem grows in size. So to avoid this issue, what we're going to do is going to achieve scaling by instead of doing all meta paths from all vertices, we'll simply sample a few meta paths from each vertex. There are quite a few advantages to this. The first is that we can, now since we're only doing a constant amount of paths per node and it's not an exponentially unbounded growth, we can now store each of these meta paths explicitly, saving us the recompute in the backward phase. Also, because the number of paths that I'm going to find is always a constant number, regardless of how large my graph gets or how large the meta path gets, there's never going to be exponential growth. I'm only ever going to choose a constant number of paths. And finally, because I'm doing sampling, I can also bias my sampling to choose the more important paths based on the current state of the scoring function. And note that the sampling is difficult to express in the matrix-based formulation because the matrix multiplies aren't fine-grained enough in order to do sampling. Everything is a bulk operation if you're doing dense matrix multiples. 
And now I'd like to move on to the experience. So what we did was we implemented both this graph formulation in the Katana Graph Engine, as well as this walk-based formulation, the former I'll call Graph GTN, GGTN, and the latter I'll call Walk GTN, WGTN. And we compare it with the original GTN implementation in PyTorch, which I will call PTGN, PGTN. The machine we evaluate on has roughly 250 gigabytes of RAM. So it's not a trivial amount. And we're going to run it on the three graphs that were used in the original GTN paper, which are shown on the right here. And the experiments in the next few slides are going to be 300 epochs, unless otherwise mentioned. And I'm going to take the average epoch time. I also institute a timeout of eight hours for these experiments. So if the average epoch time goes above 96 seconds, you'll just see the fact that it timed out. I don't believe there's any case of that in this slide deck though. So let's start off with the comparison with the original GTN, PGTN. And I have results for GGTN and PGTN and WGTN here, but for the sake of time, I'm only going to focus on WGTN. So note that on the right here, you have WGTN average epoch time in sec average epoch time in seconds on the y-axis. And for both of these figures, I'm going to use it on a four length edge length metapath. You'll note that the scale of the two figures is significantly different. You'll notice that WGTN is significantly faster than both PGTN and GGTN. In fact, if you do the math for WGTN with 50 walks, which is what this 50 at the end means, it is 155 times faster than the original PyTorch GTN. Now you might be wondering, because I'm sampling paths, won't my accuracy go down? And I'd like to get into that next. So here is the peak accuracy of each of the systems after 300 epochs of runtime. On the y-axis is the GTN classification accuracy at the end of, for the peak classification accuracy. On the x-axis there are different graphs and each of the colors is a different system. Note that WGTN doesn't actually hurt your accuracy that much. If you look at the case when we only sample 10 paths, WGTN in red here, you'll see that we do take an accuracy hit. However, if you go to say 50 paths where you're sampling more of the graph, you'll notice that we don't compromise on our accuracy. In fact, we actually get better peak accuracy in some of these cases. And the reason for this that we hypothesize is that because we have a less noisy graph because we're sampling paths rather than doing all metapaths, and because the metapath graph is significantly smaller than the original graph, all of the noise is gone. So the GCN can better basically learn the important weights for these important paths. So to reiterate, even though we're sampling paths and we're getting significantly faster speed, we don't compromise on the accuracy of classification. Now, what about scaling? Note that as I increase the number of edges in my meta path, in this case, in this example here for DBLP, the WGTN will scale. As you see, the runtime will go up much for each of the edges that I add to the minute path. Now you might, again, now the next thing I'm going to do is talk about the experiments that we did on larger graphs. If you notice the graphs in the previous slide, they were quite small, relatively speaking. So in order to test the fact that we still scale, we ran a few experiments on larger graphs. The thing with these larger graphs though, is that they don't necessarily have the features or labels needed in order to do inferencing on a graph convolutional network. So what we're going to do is we synthesize the features and labels as necessary to allow running with the GTN. Because these features are synthesized, they don't make any sense. Therefore, accuracy won't make any sense either. So we're not going to examine accuracy here. The point of these experiments is simply just to show that we continue to scale for large graphs. And note, I'd like to make this point up front that the original implementation of GTN cannot run with any of these graphs. The memory cost was too high. We tried it and it did not, it was not able to run. Here are the results of this experiment. Uh, I ran five epochs each for these larger graphs. And I took the average time again for these five epochs. Time is in seconds on the y-axis. And here I have three different systems, GGTN, which does no sampling, and the walk-based GTN with five walks and 20 walks. First, note that GGTN only was able to run on chem to bio. The other graphs were too large, even for the graph formulation that we implemented. 
Secondly, here's the two, two length metapath versus a five length metapath. You'll notice that GGTN does not scale very well at all as you increase the number of metapaths eyes because of the fact, as I mentioned, it has to re-enumerate every single path in the backward step, which is expensive. Now, if you take a look at WGTN, runtime does go up as you go from five walks to 20 walks, as you expect. And because these are larger graphs, you'll see that it does go up quite high. But if you look at the in-between numbers, we also did 10 and 15, they, it, does a, it has a linear scaling function. So it's not like it's exponentially growing like GGTN does. And also, as we increase the number of metapath edges, you'll notice that the runtime doesn't actually change much. You'll notice the y-axis on both of these is roughly the same, and the bar size is roughly the same as well. If this is because we're sampling a constant number of metapaths, and adding one more step to each of these constant metapaths isn't that expensive, relatively speaking. And finally, this last plot here is WGTN on Twitter 40, the largest of the graphs that we tested on. And note here, that we are only able to run five walks with Twitter 40. So even WGTN has a space trade-off where you need to have some amount of space in order to run. However, given enough space, you will see that we do continue to scale as you go from two edges to five edges. And it's simply, a, again, it's simply a matter of the fact that more walks and storing these walks will require more memory. To conclude, I have presented to you a graph formulation of the graph transformer network problem that is more space efficient than the original one that uses dense matrix multiplies. However, because it's computationally inefficient, because you have to enumerate all of these paths, what we do is we add sampling on top of this formulation. This decreases both the space and compute overhead. And as I showed you earlier, degradation and accuracy is pretty much non-existent if you will use a, a sufficient number of walks. And we show that WGTN and GGTN was able to run for graphs that the original formulation was not able to. And it's 155 times faster than the original uh, implementation of the GTN. And that concludes my talk. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Hello, this is Joe again. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Profiling after your sampling, what's the next largest uh, time consumer? The question is, after the sampling, what's the lar next largest time consumer? Uh, it's a reverse path creation, right? Yeah. Path creation. So basically, we create a reverse graph depending on uh, the meta path edges. So when we create a reverse graph, that is the bottleneck which we have to figure out sometime later on, but yeah, that is the current bottleneck we have. Um, that was Udit. He was someone who also worked on this with me. And yes, he's right. But again, the largest overhead is indeed the sampling step. Yes. The reason I ask is because we have uh, some GPU accelerated random walk uh, sampling methods that we're working on that could mm -hmm. really help with you know, sampling hundreds of thousands of paths in about the mm -hmm. same it takes to sample a couple hundred. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The creation of the, the basically the, what's the word? The materialization of the metapath graph is quite expensive as we did mention. So yes, that is the, other overhead that we have to deal with. Any other questions? Uh, hi, uh, we are from Grapple Street. Um, this is actually more of like a newbie question here. So. Um, I was actually kind of curious at the level of just of graph transformers in general. Um, and so uh, in, in the kind of in BERT world and in, in all the NLP world, we're able to get basically the, the interest in transformers is actually partially performance, but it's more about uh, reuse, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and being able to just layer in them for different tasks. And I, I was kind of curious if you could speak to, to that, uh, uh, your experiences there with graph transformers. Um. 
So I'm not sure if the definition of grad student swimmer you used and the one I'm talking about here are the same. In this case, all I'm doing is I'm creating a new graph based on the metapath connections and not necessarily a graph based on the transformation of node and edge features. Is Got the it. definition yeah, yeah, we're talking about the same? Or? Yeah, that's what I was, I was a little worried about. Like I, I yeah. wasn't seeing that connection with, like I was just yeah. seeing this as like a, um, some sort of hierarchy mechanism. So, okay, that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the name Graph Transformer Network came from the original paper. It wasn't our name, but yeah, I think that definition of the Graph Transformer Network that you used is different from this one, yeah. So, so then actually, let me step back then. And then in, in this case, uh, um, beyond the performance side and just kind of the accuracy side, uh, does the use of, uh, these kind of, I don't know what to call it, like transfer edges or hierarchy or whatever, or skip edges, whatever, whatever you're calling them. Um, mm -hmm. Does this, beyond performance, does this open up any new uh, kind of classification tasks or is this really purely optimization? I think it's more, it lets you optimize the classification of current GNNs by leveraging, allowing you to basically use the fact that there are nodes and edge types in the graph. I don't think it particularly, well, it might help you solve problems that weren't necessarily solvable before because you didn't have access to the heterogeneous features. So there is that, yeah. But like in terms of new classification problems, it's more of a way to improve what is already there, I would say. Great, thanks. Great. I think that's um, that sounds like that's all the questions. And I want to, again, thank our speakers, um, uh, Locke and also uh, uh, Maddie earlier. Um, and I think we will uh, reconvene for the next uh, uh, for the next month. And uh, I believe that Leo will be speaking. Or we'll find another speaker as well. And uh, until then, I want to wish everybody a great evening or um, um, morning there. And uh, we will see you next time. Yeah, again, I want to thank everybody for your participation. And bye.